Welcome everybody to Fusion Talks, a student webinar on fusion science and technology. My name is Tobias and it gives immense pleasure to introduce Kunal Zoni. Kunal is in the final year of his PhD at the University of Basel, Switzerland. He focuses on plasma surface interaction with major focus on the metallic first mirrors, constituting the optical diagnostic systems in ITER. Prior to that, he did his Erasmus Mundus Master in Nuclear Fusion Engineering Physics, um, where he was introduced to the working community in fusion. So, without any further delay, I will now mute myself and head over to Kunal. Welcome and enjoy the talk. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction, Tobias. Uh, as Tobias already mentioned, I'm uh, finishing my PhD now at the University of Basel, and uh, I've been working pretty much on, as he mentioned, the plasma cleaning of diagnostic mirrors in ITER. Uh, this is going to be a very different talk compared to most of the talks that you might have encountered because uh, I don't uh, exactly work uh, in fusion, in the field of fusions. Uh, I work more in cold plasma physics, but in the background uh, of the ITER reactor. So uh, it'll be more clear further on. Uh, a lot of work that I'll be presenting, uh, we did it uh, in a very close collaboration with ITER, uh, as well as a few, uh, several other institutes uh, with which we uh, produced some really great results. So without further ado, I'll uh, start with the presentation. Uh, I have a brief outline for the presentation. I might not necessarily go through all of them, but I will try to uh, introduce the topic and uh, discuss the principle behind mirror cleaning uh, in ITER, uh, particularly the one that I focus on and uh, explain what are the techniques uh, that are used, what are the problems that we encounter and what are the strategies that we adopt in order to uh, counter those problems. And then if time permits, I'll also talk about uh, mirror cleaning in magnetic fields uh, in ITER, uh, followed by conclusions. So uh, this is uh, the ITER reactor. Uh, most of you are aware of this. Uh, now, uh, I will not really go through uh, what exactly is hot plasma and uh, everything. I think you all know this very well. Uh, but what is important, particularly for our uh, work, is uh, the fact that the inner walls are made of beryllium and tungsten, and uh, uh, particularly that there are uh, that my work or like our work actually uh, goes away from the fusion reactor and towards the diagnostic systems uh, of these reactor, particularly the diagnostic systems that you see over here at the walls of this uh, reactor, and this is where my work comes into play. And our region of interest in particular are the optical diagnostic systems uh, that will comprise uh, most of the, several of the diagnostic systems in ITER itself. Now, a lot of these optical diagnostic systems will be composed of metallic mirrors. And these mirrors will be placed in an assembly, like in a labyrinth assembly, as we see over here. So you see like this is, this is one mirror, second mirror, third mirror, and the mirrors are assembled in this way in the diagnostic system in order to like allow the light from the fusion plasma to reach the diagnostic sensors. And it is done uh, such that this light from the fusion plasma is reflected via this labyrinth of mirrors reaching the end of the diagnostic system. And the reason why we do it this way and not directly take the light in is in order to prevent the diagnostic sensors from the energetic neutrons that also come, uh, that are also uh, bombarded. Uh, so in this way, we deflect these neutrons in order to like, uh, and prevent them from reaching a diagnostic sensor. So now these first uh, mirrors, of course, they uh, are crucial in this particular aspect because they are the front facing components of the diagnostic systems and they uh, sort of like look into the fusion reaction. So essentially they are very important and they allow the light from the fusion plasma to reach the diagnostic. And it also uh, has a very important job of safeguarding the diagnostic from the energetic neutrons. But because they are the first elements in the optical pathway, they are also exposed to high particle fluxes as well as high power fluxes. And very importantly, they undergo constant surface erosion because of charge exchange neutrals that come from uh, the fusion plasma. And also they get constantly deposited from the wall materials of the first, uh, of the ETA wall, particularly beryllium and tungsten, which is sputtered from the first wall and the diverter. 
uh, can get uh, uh, redeposited or like deposited on these mirrors. And when that happens, this would degrade the optical properties of these uh, first mirrors. And as you can imagine, if the optical properties of these mirrors are lowered, then, then like the quality of the signal and the data that you receive at the end of the diagnostic will be significantly compromised. So it is important to keep these mirrors clean uh, and keep the optical properties of these mirrors high. And the, the way we do this is uh, cleaning these mirrors or the surfaces of these mirrors using cold radio frequency discharges. There are several other ways in which you can achieve this. And one of the ways that uh, they foresee to implement this in ETER is using radio frequency discharges. Now, of course, in these particular, these are the same discharges that you use in industrial plasma processing. Uh, and in these particular discharges, the electron temperature is much larger than the ion temperature. Um, now, just to give you a brief understanding of how exactly the how exactly the uh, uh, the system works, so we use these mirrors, these mirror samples, or these mirrors uh, as an electrode, and we supply radio frequency directly to uh, RF voltage directly to the mirrors itself. And these uh, are capacitively coupled, meaning that there is a capacitance between uh, the RF voltage and uh, the first mirror. Now, the entire vacuum chamber, which uh, could be your diagnostic duct in your uh, uh, diagnostic system, it acts as the grounded chamber, uh, as, a, as the grounded electrode. And uh, now, as a result, there's a plasma generated in this uh, chamber. And uh, because of the difference of the areas between your powered electrode, which is your first mirror, and the counter electrode, which is your vacuum uh, system, the first mirror, it attains a negative self-bias. So the mirror itself has a negative potential, and the plasma potential is, usually is as by definition, it is positive. And uh, now, as you can imagine, it forms a sheath around the first mirrors, and the ions bombard the surface of the mirror with an ion energy of Vp minus Vtc. While it bombards the surface of the walls, which would be your diagnostic duct, uh, with an ion energy of EVP. Now, uh, as I mentioned, they bombard the surface, and uh, as a result, you are able to clean all the contaminants or sputter away all the contaminants that are on the surface of the mirrors. Uh, now, in a normal capacitively coupled plasma, we have a plasma, we talk about a plasma potential of roughly 20 to 30 EV, and the self bias voltage VDC, it can be controlled directly by changing the RF voltage uh, at your generator the RF generators, but uh, the normal case scenario, for example, where we would be using uh, our self bias voltage would be roughly between 180 to 200 uh, volts. So as you can imagine, the ion energy at the first mirror is roughly uh, 200, and 200 to uh, 230 EV, uh, while the ion energy at the walls is roughly 20 to 30 EV. So it, is bomb uh, so it sputters away a lot of the top surface of the first mirror eliminating the contaminants that are deposited on its surface. So uh, in a lot of this work that I that we do, like we uh, do the plasma diagnostics using Langmuir probes in order to study the properties of plasma, uh, we use a retarding field energy analyzer in order to study the ion energy distribution function at the surfaces uh, and the ion flux distribution uh, on uh, powered and grounded surfaces. And we also use optical emission spectroscopy to study the species of ions in your uh, plasma. Uh, but at the same time, we also do plasma surface interactions. We do a lot of surface, stu uh, surface studies, uh, particularly characterizing the surfaces of the mirrors and other samples using XPS, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, uh, EDX analysis. Uh, we also do a lot of focused ion beam scanning electron microscopy. Uh, and because I work on, because we have to like eventually uh, study the reflective properties or the optical properties of the mirrors, we do a lot of photo, uh, spectrophotometry in order to study the reflectivity of the surfaces. And we also do a lot of profilometry in order to study the topography and the roughness of the surfaces, uh, particularly the first mirrors. So this was a brief uh, uh, introduction of the process of, of the method itself. Uh, now I'll talk about the sputtering regime based on the plasma surface characteristics. Now, when I talked about uh, that the ions are bombarding your surface of the mirrors, uh, there are different ways in which uh, the, it removes the contaminants from the surface. 
Uh, one most commonly used uh, regime of sputtering is the physical sputtering regime, which basically, uh, as, as the name suggests, it uh, basically sputters the surfaces or atoms from the top surface by momentum transfer, uh, which uh, from the uh, projectile ions, which generates a collision cascade on the top surfaces, which leads to ejection of the atoms of the top surfaces. Now, we do this at, uh, very, uh, with heavy ions and at high energy. So particularly argon is used for our studies in an, and we use an ion energy of uh, in the range anywhere between 50 to 300 EV. Now this clearly has high sputtering yields be, uh, because it is uh, momentum transfer. And this uh, improves your surface cleaning because you're able to eliminate all the surface contaminants by sputtering them. And it definitely improves your mirror reflectivity. But at the same time, uh, because it is uh, basically a momentum-based uh, transfer, there's a momentum transfer, it can also uh, lead to iron-induced surface damage, uh, which can increase the surface roughness, which could eventually degrade the reflectivity. So you have to have an optimum so, so as to like improve your mirror to, so as to obtain cleaning, but at the same time, not uh, make the surface rough. Uh, and the reflectivity that we eventually obtain is a mix of both these processes that I mentioned. So what we normally talk about when we talk about the reflectivity of the mirrors uh, in particular is the specular reflectivity. This is the mirror-like reflectivity of uh, the surf of the first mirrors. Uh, this is essentially the total minus the diffuse reflectivity. Now the total reflect, uh, reflectivity basically comes from the removal of your surface contaminants. So the more surface contaminants you remove, the total reflectivity of uh, your mirror material will go up. Yeah, and the total and the diffuse reflectivity is uh, the scattered reflectivity of a surface. And this basically comes with your surface damage or roughness. So the more uh, damage that you have on the surface, the more rough is your surface, the higher will be your diffuse reflectivity. So in order to in, uh, keep your specular reflectivity high, you need to make sure your total reflectivity is high uh, and your diffuse reflectivity is low. Uh, now, as I mentioned, with this argon cleaning, we usually uh, are able to like increase uh, the diffuse, increase the total reflectivity by cleaning the top surface contaminants. But at the same time, we also have an impact on the diffuse reflectivity because it uh, ends up creating. Uh, certain nanostructural uh, voids or certain uh, grain uh, damage uh, on the surface itself. Uh, one particular thing that you can see over here is uh, this uh, study that I did where I was bombarding surfaces of, of rhodium with uh, argon and upon prolonged exposure you start to see that there are like voids that are formed on the surface of these, uh, on the surface of these mirrors, and these voids then contribute to the surface roughness and increase the diffuse reflectivity, eventually lowering your specular reflectivity. Uh, so uh, all these uh, results uh, were published, and if you want to study more about this, you can uh, have a look at this. Uh, uh, you can have a look at this link later. Um, now, another regime of sputtering, now because of the problems that I mentioned that comes with the physical sputtering, there's ion induced surface damage, and sometimes you might not really want that. You, you want the surface to remain pristine and just remove the contaminants. So we also, there's another uh, regime of sputtering that is under investigation, which is the chemically assisted physical sputtering. Now, the principle behind this kind of sputtering relies on formation of chemical bonds between your projectiles. So say if you're using deuterium for sputtering your surface of the mirrors, and the mirrors have a contamination, contamination of beryllium and tungsten that comes from the first wall of the ITER reactor. So deuterium is able to form BED molecules, uh, uh, bonding with the BE molecules, beryllium molecules on the surface, and this lowers the sputtering uh, uh, this lowers the surface binding energy of uh, BED molecules. So now this can be removed more easily. And uh, by this technique, by physically assisted chemical sputtering, you can use very low energies, like between 10 to 60 EV in order to like remove your surface contaminants. Uh, now, clearly, because it has very low energies uh, that we are using, it has very, uh, it, ha it doesn't pose that kind of threat in order to create surface damage or nanostructuration of any sort. But because uh, it also has very low sputtering yields and the cleaning usually is very slow in comparison to what you can achieve with physical sputtering. 
One particular problem that we face with chemically assisted physical sputtering is what we call tungsten enrichment. Um, now, most of your uh, contamination that happens on the surface of the mirrors is uh, beryllium and tungsten, and tungsten can be mixed with beryllium. Now, uh, what this could mean that if you use deuterium in order to like remove your beryllium atoms from the surface, this can uh, create a layer of tungsten which would not be uh, removed by deuterium, and this tungsten can e eventually act as a shield, blocking all the beryllium contaminants underneath it. So this has been observed as well in our experiments, and uh, you can get more information uh, in this paper. So uh, there's also chemical sputtering, but this I'll not go in detail. Uh, I'll now strictly jump uh, to the first mirror cleaning via notch filter, because this is also a major part of my PhD work. Now, I told you that the first mirrors are used in all these optical diagnostic systems, and in ITER, these first mirrors have uh, could be essentially implemented with in presence of a notch filter. What exactly this means is that you would have a first mirror and everything is getting, uh, you have a capacitively coupled plasma, everything remains same as I mentioned earlier, but uh, there is a special configuration where you might have to uh, create a notch filter. Now, what this means is that you attach a coaxial, uh, you attach a coaxial cable uh, in series with your first mirror, and you short circuit the inner and outer conductor of this uh, coaxial cable. Now, this means that the capacitance that you originally had is short circuited, and as a result, the DC potential that would normally be developed on this first mirror would go uh, to zero uh, because the capacitance is short circuited. Now this uh, leads to a significant increase in the plasma potential. And uh, this means that both your mirror uh, is now sputtered with an ion energy of EVP and your wall is now also sputtered with the same ion energy of EVP. EVP. Uh, as a result, you can, uh, like uh, we also did like a detailed study of this, but I will not go so much in detail over here. Uh, so let's skip all this. But uh, coming back to this, like in the study that we that uh, I have skipped now, you can get more details in this paper of mine. But what we found is that keeping everything same and we just attach a notch filter, the plasma potential can increase uh, from 20 volts, which earlier is in the case of a capacitively coupled plasma, it can jump uh, straight to 140 volts. So it's a nearly seven, eight times jump in the plasma potential. And as you can imagine, a high plasma potential will lead to a higher sputtering of the first mirror, but it will also increase the sputtering of the surrounding walls. And this would then interfere, this would then get uh, sputtered and this would then get uh, deposited back on your first mirrors, which could now interfere with your process of the cleaning of first mirrors. So this is a major problem and we actually uh, studied this. So in this particular case, as we see, the first mirror, uh, is in a regime which uh, in a, a gray area between uh, the erosion of first mirrors and the deposition of wall material. And you have like a balance between the two. Now in it, this balance is different, usually created because of the geometrical properties of the system, the iron energies, the material that we are using as well. Uh, but we particularly studied uh, in this particular configuration with copper walls. And we saw that if we originally start the mirror with a clean surface and we just expose it to helium plasma with 90 EV ion energy, instead of, instead of keeping the surface clean and sputtering the surface, uh, we have a balance such that there is a net deposition of the wall material on the surface of the mirror. Uh, and we measured that after 14 hours of, 14 hour of exposure, you have a 35 nanometer deposition of copper on the surface. So this clearly shows you how big the problem is. If you attach a notch filter, you cannot clean the surfaces of your mirrors anymore. In turn, it gets, it makes them even more dirty. And uh, now we need to find uh, solutions in order to solve this. And we do this, we can do this now either by increasing the preferential mirror sputtering, or we can do this by reducing the wall sputtering. Uh, so, in effect, we need to bring this slider, which is now towards wall deposition, back towards the erosion of first mirrors. 
Um, now for this, we uh, designed a first mirror unit, uh, as we see. So this is like mimicking uh, the first mirrors in ITER diagnostic systems, and we would do all the experiments on this uh, in order to show that this would be directly applicable in ITER diagnostic systems as well. I will be showing, uh, I will be mainly talking about, uh, uh, so there are three techniques in, uh, in total that uh, we developed, but I would mainly talk about two uh, more interesting techniques, so which are grounded grids and floating walls. Uh, so I'll skip this and I'll go straight to grounded grids. So what exactly happens over here uh, is that normally when we, we use a radio frequency of 60 megahertz, we attach a notch filter and the mirror M1 is the first mirror used, is used as a powered electrode and we generate a RF plasma inside our first mirror unit and the mirror M2 is grounded, the walls of the FMU of first mirror unit are grounded as well. Now we measure the ion energy distribution at the walls using a retarding field energy analyzer and we see that the ion energy uh, distribution obtains a peak at one particular energy, which is understandable because you have a plasma potential and all the ions reach the surface of uh, the grounded wall with that particular energy. So you have a single peak of, uh, of ion energy distribution. Now we attach grounded grids uh, on either side or be before between the mirrors and the walls. And we again keep all the parameters same and we just measure the ion energy distribution function. Now we select the grids or we select these uh, mesh, uh, keeping into mind that the sheet thickness that you would have is greater than the grid hole width. And what this essentially means is that your plasma is confined inside your grids. It does not expand outside. Now, in this particular case, if I again measure the ion energy distribution function, keeping all the parameters same, we see that the same ion energy, uh, this ion energy, energy distribution function splits into two peaks, uh, with one peak still being at the high ion energy that we observed earlier, and there's a generation of a second lower peak, uh, which uh, is at a energy almost less than uh, half of the original ion energy. Overall, the ion energy distribution function is modified just by adding grids around it. And we see that we have two peak distribution, uh, but more importantly, the ion flux at the walls is reduced, right? So ion flux is basically the area under the curve. And as you can see, the area under the curve is much lower over here, uh, given the scale is the same. Uh, this is how the plasma looks like uh, in addition of grids. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is confined within the grids itself and it does not escape uh, the grids. Now, I did some further studies in order to understand where exactly you are getting the second peak from. And uh, we realized that the second peak comes from charge exchange collisions between the ions that escape uh, the grids and they undergo collisions with uh, neutrals inside this uh, electric field free zone. Uh, so this uh, ions, they undergo with uh, collisions with helium neutrals leading to formation of helium, uh, secondary helium ions, which we call cold ions, which is generated by collisions and uh, leads to formation of neutrals. Now, in order to study this uh, further, I obtained the fluxes of these two uh, peaks as a function of pressure. And we can see that uh, the ratio of the flux of the fast ions that leave the grid and the slow ions that are generated uh, inside this region, uh, we can see that this is a function of the resonant charge exchange collisions. Uh, and this ratio, if this is a function of collisions, then this ratio should be inversely proportional, of the, inversely proportional to the collision frequency. Uh, of uh, the collisions between the ions and the neutrals. Now the collision frequency is dependent directly on the pressure. So we can see that the ratio of the fast ion flux and the low uh, cold ion flux is inversely proportional to one over P. And if we look at the experimental distribution of the fast and cold ion flux and we take the ratio against pressure, we see that it very nicely follows a one over P uh, relation. Uh, verifying the fact that this indeed comes from, uh, this uh, peak is indeed generated by cold ions based on collisions. Now, importantly, uh, very, what is important is that uh, now the flux at the walls is significantly reduced. And 
uh, it is reduced like by almost three times uh, in presence of grids. So now if the iron flux at the walls is reduced, the sputtering of the walls will be reduced as well. And so you have less deposition. And as you can see in the same parameters, we are able to like have uh, clean surfaces of mirrors after the cleaning in presence of grids in comparison to a completely deposited surface of mirror in absence of uh, grids. And even if we look at the reflective properties of these uh, mirrors, so we take these insets in order and measure the reflectivity. Uh, the reflectivity of these insets, even after the exposure to plasma for 14 hours, we saw that the reflectivity of these insets was, was maintained at near pristine value. So this is the pristine reflectivity and this is the reflectivity after uh, the exposure of the mirror. So it was as good as new. Uh, however, without grids, the reflectivity was as low as 0% almost. So this clearly shows that this uh, strategy works very nicely and uh, has potential of use in the diagnostic systems in ITER uh, for mirror cleaning with notch filter. Another useful technique that I'll be showing is floating walls. So now in this particular case, what we do that instead of grounding the walls of the first mirror unit, we just allow them to, we just keep them floating. Now we keep the walls floating, but the mirrors M1 and M2 are grounded. Uh, so M1 is DC grounded because of notch filter and M2 is directly grounded. Now on floating surfaces, the iron energy uh, at these floating surfaces correspond to VP minus VF, where VF is the floating potential. So the walls, if they are floating, they acquire the floating potential VF, and then the iron energy uh, at the walls is VP minus VF. But because M1 and M2 are grounded, the iron, the iron energy at M1 and M2 uh, corresponds to EVP. Now, uh, what exactly does this mean? This VP minus VF in, in plasma physics, this is a value that depends uh, uh, pretty much on the electron temperature uh, with this factor. It depends on the ion and uh, electron masses as well. But as you can see, this difference of uh, pl uh, plasma and floating potential uh, depends majorly on the electron temperature. And in, in a cold RF plasma, the electron temperature is nearly uh, conserved uh, as a, it is usually between three to four EV uh, in a cold uh, radio frequency plasma. I mean, it can vary, but it is usually not such a drastically changing feature. Now, uh, I also studied this as a function of RF power. So we're using a retarding field energy analyzer. And as you can see that uh, if I just look at the walls, as we increase the RF power, the iron energy at the walls remains constant. It doesn't fluctuate at all so, uh, upon increasing the RF power. So even if I use an RF power of 160 watt, the iron energy at the wall is still 30 volts. But at the grounded M2, the iron energy keeps on increasing as a function of RF power because as you increase the RF power, the plasma potential increases. And you can reach a difference in the iron energy of as high as uh, 180 uh, EV, which is a pro positive news because now I can sputter my mirrors M1 and M2 with a higher iron energy and keep my iron energy at the walls at a bare minimum of 30 EV, uh, which means the walls are sputtered less, the mirrors are sputtered more, and I can reach a uh, cleaning of the mirrors, which is exactly what I saw. Uh, the peak iron energy in, in, uh, at the walls in case of floating walls is reduced uh, significantly from uh, 130 EV to uh, near to 30 EV. So that's a 100 EV reduction. But and the mirrors in this particular case, are there is no wall deposition on these mirrors. Uh, upon measurement, we see that there's less than one nanometer of copper deposition. And the mirrors themselves are as good as pristine uh, values. Uh, the reflectivity of the mirrors is as good as pristine values. Again, meaning that floating walls uh, also serve as a very good mitigation strategies for mirror cleaning in ETA in the presence of a notch filter. Now, if I have, uh, actually, I think I'm, I've run out of time, right? Tobias? Well, in five minutes, if you want, you can, you can go on. Yeah. So I just want to show some results of mirror cleaning in magnetic fields because this is like particularly, this is one of my favorites and this is very interesting uh, because uh, we all know that there will be three to 3.8 Tesla of toroidal magnetic field at the diagnostic ports in ITER. Now we all talk about plasma cleaning of these mirrors, but you have to take into account that this magnetic field will be present during plasma cleaning of these mirrors 
And these magnetic fields will significantly influence your plasma properties and plasma surface interactions uh, with the mirror. So we thought that it was important to study the cleaning of uh, the same mirrors that I talked about and wall sputtering in the presence of magnetic fields. And we did like a very interesting, uh, so we developed also a first mirror unit uh, relevant to ITER for this particular purpose. And in order to get a magnetic field of three to 3.8 Tesla, we took help, uh, we collaborated with the University Hospital in Basel, uh, especially with the Magnetic Resonance Imaging Group, uh, where they have like a huge MRI machine, uh, as you see over here. Uh, and instead of putting, uh, they have like a huge uh, chamber uh, inside which we sort of just put our first mirror unit inside this magnetic field uh, domain. So now inside this uh, chamber, now there is a magnetic field of three Tesla, uh, going on and you could also rotate this chamber in order to change the angle between your surface normal uh, between M1 and the magnetic field itself. Now, I will not go so much into the details of this, but what, what is particularly interesting over here is that normally when you generate a plasma using your electrode, uh, in absence of magnetic field, it will expand in your entire chamber. But because of a strong magnetic field, the plasma basically gets confined uh, in the bounds of your electrode and it just expands in the, in the direction of the magnetic field. So as you can see over here, the plasma basically got confined uh, along the bounds of the electrode and it basically created a cylindrical beam uh, that uh, contacts this region of the wall material and every all the other portions of the walls are free of any plasma surface interaction. Now, what is particularly interesting over here uh, is uh, one particular result that I found interesting was uh, I wanted to study how the self bias voltage at the uh, electrode M1 varies as a function of angle between the magnetic field and the surface normal itself. And we see that we, it follows like a very strange profile. Uh, as we see over here, it increases as we increase the angle uh, alpha, then it decreases again, and then it reaches like nearly zero values. Uh, now, in order to study this, we we'll look a little bit further into how self-bias actually varies. So self-bias actually at the electrode depends on the RF potential that you supply at the electrode and the capacitance of the sheath, uh, the sheath capacitances of the grounded uh, wall and the powered electrode, which is your M1, which and your sheath capacitances basically depend on your areas of the powered and the grounded electrode. So particularly important over here is this ratio AG over AP, where AG is the grounded area and AP is the powered area. Now, as we increase the, as we change the angle, uh, this uh, grounded area now is not, uh, now the entire chamber does not act as the grounded area anymore. Even though it is grounded, the only grounded area that sort of effectively acts is the grounded area, which is wet by the plasma column. So in this particular case, we have the grounded area of it, uh, which is this one. And as we start to change the angle, the, the wetted area sort of starts to change as well. And if I plot how the wetted area changes as a function of angle, this is what I see. So it follows a very nice, uh, uh, it follows like a very identical profile, uh, how your area ratio changes as a function of angle as to what we see in the cell bias voltage itself. And this clearly indicates that this uh, change in the wetted area is actually the effective area that contributes to uh, these uh, uh, RF discharges and it changes as a result of this. This also means that because only this area is wet, only this area of the wall gets sputtered and the mirror, because a very low area of the wall gets sputtered, the mirror is nearly clean. And if I increase the angle and sputter a great area of the wall, the mirror is actually deposited uh, M2, but the mirror on M1 itself is very clean itself. Meaning that in, in presence of magnetic fields, uh, mirror cleaning is particularly interesting uh, because there is no deposition on M1 and the deposition on M2 can be controlled by changing the angle. There are also other problems, uh, particularly concerning as to how the surface of the mirror itself is sputtered and we see that it is actually sputtered in a very non-homogeneous fashion, which is again a problem for ITER, but I will skip this uh, for now. Uh, so in conclusion, we, uh, we see that capacitively coupled RF plasmas are an important tool for surface sputtering because of presence of negative self bias on the powered electrodes, which is what we would use in the first mirrors. 
Uh, now, this uh, cleaning of the surfaces of the first mirrors can be done either by physically uh, physical sputtering or by chemically assisted physical sputtering, uh, having trade-offs in both the cases. Uh, then we saw that capacitively coupled RF plasma cleaning with DC grounding uh, of the first mirrors, which is in presence of a notch filter, it leads it uh, reduces your self bias potential to zero, and your plasma potential increases by over ten times, which increases your wall sputtering and deposition. And we uh, talked about uh, techniques like the grounded grids and the floating walls in order to control this wall sputtering and deposition and have a uh, higher cleaning rate of the mirror. And then we talked about how magnetic field confines your plasma discharge, decreases your wetted area and deposition, and eventually it also leads to a non-homogeneous mirror cleaning, which I've skipped for now. So thank you very much uh, for your attention and hope uh, you were able to follow. Thank you very much for this very informative and educational talk. And now I would like to open the Q&A. If you have questions, please be so free. Oh, perfect. The first one is incoming from Ulrich. Um, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Hello, hello. Yes, my name is Ulrich from F3. So I have a quick question that I didn't quite catch the answer to. So out of the, the grounding grids and the floating walls, which of the two do you think is better? Uh, is it, so what about the same results? Uh, no, like, to not using absolutely it? not. Like, so the floating walls so over here definitely have like a much better potential in order to like lower the wall sputtering because you are really uh, reducing the iron energy down to a bare minimum on these walls. So it is definitely a better uh, system. But, you know, like when you're talking about the R&D of uh, this diagnostic mirrors and heater, you have to like also take into consideration that you cannot float all the walls of uh, the diagnostic ducts or like maybe they are not open to like keeping all the walls uh, floating because of some other issues. And they, uh, in that particular case, uh, it might be easier to like just put a grid around between the mirror surface and the uh, diagnostic walls. Uh, so essentially, uh, it could be the case, like as of now, it is not uh, clear, but it could be the case that they use a mix of dif dif uh, different mitigation strategies in order to control the wall deposition and promote the mirror sputtering. I guess so. Otherwise, you can always unmute yourself. <laughs> ah, sorry. Yeah, no, it answers the question. Yeah, just I think one comment. I think um, the, the floating of the walls, yeah, it's not really possible in each or it's quite challenging to, to implement it well yeah what is interesting on what uh, we think uh, particularly is that you know if we are doing mirror cleaning in magnetic fields and you see that only this particular part of the wall is sputtered uh, as you can see only this particular part of the wall is sputtered so if we know this in advance you can float just this region of the wall or like the region of the wall that you anticipate would be sputtered in the diagnostic ducts and just float them. And you know, once you float them, that they will get spotted a lot less and this would lead to less deposition of your mirrors in the magnet. Okay, one question. If you float that section, would then you, would you then start sputtering other sections of the wall? No, or, because, or because, the, because the plasma discharge is still guided by the magnetic field. So it would still sputter only, only the floating region of the wall. Okay, thank you. So great. Now, Mark Andre, you're next. Ah, I think it's working. Yes, ah, perfect. Thank you. Hey, excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I <coughs> just had, I guess, a little bit more of an open-ended question, which was um, to maybe gauge your thoughts on, you know, the complexity of implementing fundamentally some sort of deposition cleaning, um, mirror cleaning in, uh, you know, fusion devices, just based on the fact that the, to implement a design that allows a level of mirror cleaning, basically the way that I see things is that the mirror cleaning can actually have hazardous effects to your optics and it also increases the complexity in the vessel in an area which has a very limited amount of space to work with given radiation shielding requirements and all kinds of other things. So I, I just kind of wanted to get this, it's an open-ended question, your feel on some, you know, your thoughts on, on how to 
maybe approach balance the balancing act of you know the design complexity and the the beneficial uh, you know effect of this versus the potential risk and the difficulty of actually actually implementing it versus say for example just designing it such that you can replace the mirrors during a maintenance step I, I know it sounds silly but uh, yeah, so it's, it's replacing, an replacing mirrors. So, like the thing is, doing each uh, pulse of fusion plasma, like these mirrors will be exposed, and these mirrors will always get deposited every time they uh, are undergoing like this diagnostic activity. And you need to now clean these mirrors before starting your next measurement. And just for cleaning these mirrors, you will not open the uh, chamber and take the mirrors out. You need to like find a way in order to like keep this mirror to achieve the cleaning of these mirrors before starting the next uh, uh, diagnostic activity. And that's the reason why this all these things are done in C2 uh, and the mirrors uh, replacing the mirrors by opening the chamber is not an option. Right, I understand that, but also designing this in is also not an option for certain diagnostics. There just is not space. Um, you know, any space that you need for all of this greatly yeah. reduces how much radiation shielding you have, which is shut down dose rate for anything in the diagnostics areas, which is mm -hmm. basically mandatory for radiation compliance and nuclear safety mm -hmm. compliance. So it's, it, it's it's tough. I, I you know it's just a it's not one of these easy things, right? I mean, I, yeah, exactly. I I would I would love to I would love to just say hey let's let's go for it in every situation, yeah. but I, it's complex. I I just wanted to gauge your thoughts on the I I know the, I mean uh, the we, balancing act. I mean, as 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 a uh, as as somebody who works in this area, I mean, I I can just. Uh, do my part of uh, suggesting different techniques and strategies that you can use uh, to reduce your, to, in order to achieve your mirror cleaning and yeah. reduce your wall deposition. But eventually it's down to uh, the diagnostic team in ETA, like what exactly they want to implement. And yeah, no, agreed. I actually wish that I knew more about this and had seen your presentation back when I worked in the oil industry because we were working on x-ray tubes and I was yeah. uh, doing discharge cleaning using argon and it sputtered uh, uh, covar material all over ceramics and we, we yeah. couldn't get any of the high voltage standoff we needed for each stage of the x-ray tube. This would have been very helpful because had we mixed this with the magnetic field, yeah. we probably would have been able to keep some of the secondary emission from depositing itself on, on ceramic surfaces. But exactly. it, it is, it's definitely a complex, um, thing to implement um but this yeah. this is really uh this is and very informative exactly and one thing what i didn't really mention is that uh, you know i've been talking all this while about about this whole my phd work was basically done in the presence of what we call a notch filter like adding this coaxial connector hmm. now the reason why we did this whole work or this whole r d work is in order to simplify the engineering in the diagnostic ducts and eater because the mirrors are going to be cooled down by metallic water pipes uh, because they will be constantly heating up. And this metallic water cooling pipes will lead to DC ground, uh, will lead to RF grounding of these first mirrors if they are in direct contact. And as a result, we plan to like implement this water cooling pipes in the fashion of a notch filter. And because that cannot be changed, we need to now think of how exactly we can achieve mirror cleaning so that the water cooling pipes can be integrated in the first mirrors in, uh, and you can integrate them in the fashion of uh, a water wavelength uh, filter. Right. Yeah, so this whole it, it was done because uh, there is a boundary condition already in the diagnostic ducts and eater. Yeah, understood. No, I mean, this is even important from an eddy current perspective as well, because your first mirrors, since they have to be actively cooled with water, it, it means that you, you can't put electrical isolation necessarily where you want it to be to even control eddy currents. So, you know, you always have a conductive path through the water transmission pipes that go to any sort of cooling block in, in, uh, in the front where the primary mirrors are. Yeah, no, that's, uh, it's a tricky uh, implementation for sure. Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. Great. For now, I would like to read a question asked by the audience, um, and it sounds follow. 
Do you think the inhomogeneity of the magnetic field on ether will have a significant effect, or can a homogeneous field be assumed as in the MRI case? I um, don't really know how homogeneous uh, the field is going to be at uh, the, uh, uh, in particularly in the case of this diagnostic duct that we have, but I, I, I can assume it's uh, fairly homogeneous in the range of three to 3.8 Tesla. And uh, I do not think that the inhomogeneity in the field strength itself is going to be such a major problem. But uh, what is going to be a problem in particular is how the presence of magnetic field and how the magnetic field, so for example, like this particular study I didn't talk about, but if your magnetic field is at a grazing angle with uh, your uh, first mirror, which is most likely going to be the case, then uh, the this will lead to a non-homogeneous sputtering of your mirror surface. And this would end up causing like this, uh, is, uh, this as we see over here, that at the center of your mirror, there will be a lot more sputtering compared to your edges. Uh, and this will sort of create like this erosion profile, which is not really beneficial or not really desired in each. And this would really change the surface topography of the mirror itself, because as you can see, the difference between the highest and the lowest point is as much as four or five times uh, so this could be a major problem, but I, I, I'm not so, uh, I, I don't think like the field strength in, homo, in homogeneity itself could be like a major, uh, it would cause any major problems. Thank you. I think that answered the question. If not, well, you can write me. And meanwhile, I got another question like from the audience. So it's about... Um, out in implementation. So the matching circuit and the notch must be close to the mirror. So yeah. how in ETA will this, how in the ETA environment will this, will this be implemented? Can you repeat again, sorry? Yeah, like the matching circuit and the notch like you've been talking about yeah. in the question before. And um, how in the ETA environment will this be implemented? So I'm not so sure if I have the design uh, over here, but let's see if I do. In the additional slide, if I have something. So I don't really have the design, but uh, uh, over here, but there is, there's a, as I was mentioning earlier, there is, there is going to be like these water cooling, uh, there's going to be like these water cooling lines that go inside the first mirror itself. And, uh, like these water cooling lines will serve two purposes. So one, they will be the water cooling lines themselves, but because they will be integrated in such a fashion that uh, these water cooling lines also serve as a notch filter. Uh, the matching circuit and the RF generator itself, I, uh, as of now, I don't really know where exactly they are going to be placed and how exactly it is placed in the mirror assembly of the system itself. I also think this answers the question. Anyway, you can write me. Um, I have one question myself. Maybe it's just like a, a quick question and I didn't understand it correctly. Like you proposed this um, grid model to, to solve these kind of issues, for example. But how yeah. would you implement the grid into Ether? Like how you can't just put some grid in there and say, okay, now it's fine. So how would you do that? Yeah, absolutely. So that uh, that is the... Uh, that, that is their job, like how they want to implement it. Okay. <laughs> My job is to suggest them techniques and how exactly we can uh, achieve certain uh, goals. And then it's up to them as to how they want to implement it. I see. Okay. <laughs> and again, Kuna, thank you very much for your talk. Yeah. It was really, really entertaining and informative. So, yeah, thank Goodbye. you very much. Thank you. Uh, <laughs>